Okay. Good morning, everyone. Happy Mother's Day. It's a joy to be with you all today, and we're going to be talking a little bit about obedience later today and the comfort that we can find in obedience, and I think that's a message that most mothers and parents here in the here with us today can affirm. Um, but first, let me read a, a, a quick um, passage from Psalm 119. Teach me, Lord, the way of your decrees, that I may follow it to the end. Give me understanding, so that I may keep your law and obey it with all my heart. Direct me in the path of your commands, for there I find delight. Turn my heart toward your statutes and not toward selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. Fulfill your promise to your servant so that you may be feared. Take away the disgrace I dread, for your laws are good. How I long for your precepts and your righteousness preserve my life. Now, the, that righteousness that the psalmist talks about there is something that for a lot of people feels unattainable, right? We don't really have access to that through the things that we do, but the good news of the gospel, in which we're going to be talking a little bit more about today, is that as we walk with Jesus, as we commit ourselves to him, as we mirror our lives on his, we do have access to that. We do have access to that, that way, that truth, that life that we can live and be reconciled to God, be with God. And so as we sing in worship today, let's remember that. Let's be thinking about that and praying on that. And I pray that's on your hearts this morning. But let's worship. You're invited to stand and sing. Oh, got on mute. of the earth from the depths of the sea from the heights of the heavens your name be praised from the hearts of the weak from the shouts of the strong from the lips of all
with nothing to bring but all of my heart and how could this be the way he looks in my eyes all broken he loves me cause he loves me just because he does tired and Because he does I'm his beloved And I am his friend His love has no Isaiah chapter 35. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the feeble hands. Steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear. 
Your God will come. He will come with vengeance. With divine retribution, he will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling springs. In the haunts where jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. And a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. It will be for those who walk on that way. The unclean will not journey on it. Wicked fools will not go about on it. No lion will be there, nor any ravenous beast. They will not be found there. But only the redeemed will walk there. And those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them. And sorrow and sighing will flee away. You may be seated. I don't have enough words I'll never live enough lifetimes To fully know your word To know all that you deserve And all of my deceptions And all of my duplicity Now there is no record you assume the best of me. This is why I thank the Lord for saving me when I was weak. So I will sing. This is why I thank the Lord for everything. This is why I thank the Lord. And all of my affection and everything I have to give the sum of my attention is measured in the praise I live this is how I thank the Lord for saving me when I was weak so I will sing this is how I thank the Lord for everything this is how I will sing, I will sing, I will lift my praises to you. I will sing, I will sing, I will lift my praises to you. I will sing, I will sing, I will lift my praises to you. And I will sing, I will sing, because this is how I praise the Lord. This is how I thank the Lord for saving me when I was weak. So I will sing. This is how I thank the Lord for everything. This is how I thank the Lord. This is how I thank the Lord for loving me and keeping me. So I will sing. This is how I thank the Lord for everything. bow your heads and pray with me. O oh God of provision and unconditional love, on this day when we acknowledge the importance of motherhood among us, we first give thanks that you are a loving parent to us all. From your being all, from your being, all life was born, and in you all creation is nurtured. 
You have formed us in your image as your children and gathered us together under your wing. You have united us as kindred members of one human family, and we are grateful to be your offspring together. We celebrate your divine love reflected in human expressions of motherhood. We give thanks to you for the mothers among us and ask that you strengthen them in their daily tasks. Grant them wisdom in the lessons they teach, patience in the discipline they foster, and persistence in their promotion of decency and compassion, both by word and example. May they be given the honor and thanks they deserve, but do not often receive. We thank you for all motherly figures, grandmothers, aunts, sisters, wives, stepmothers, foster mothers, guardians, babysitters, teachers, healthcare providers, neighbors, friends, loved ones, and many others who practice self-sacrifice and embody compassion to all who are privileged to be in their influence. Grant them vigor to carry on their work and the satisfaction that the holy privilege of their tasks affords. We acknowledge you to you, O oh God, that even amid our grateful celebration, many of us come with restless spirits, reluctant to name the difficulties of this day. For some, this day brings sorrowful awareness of their own inability to have their children. Draw your tender spirit near their grief and remind them that those who struggle with infertility have always shared a special place in your heart. We pray for those who have suffered miscarriages, those fatigued by fertility and treatments, fertility treatments, and those struggling through the process of adoption. May they remember that in your power and through your church, they can still leave a lasting legacy beyond themselves. For some, this day is marked by loneliness and grief as they spend this Mother's Day as a widower, an orphan, or a parent who has lost a child. To those who today live in the wake of death of a loved one, grant glimpses of the resurrection. Bring them to a steady restoration of their broken hearts. Allow them to live in, into their future with hope and empower them to carry out the legacy of lessons instilled within them. For some, this is a day that surfaces ongoing tensions that exist within our personal relationships and family dynamics. We ask for healing from the wounds of our past, a path of forgiveness for wronged, wrongs both experienced and committed, and the rebuilding of trust forged in honesty, authentic, authenticity, and love. God, we thank you that you are the God who sees us. Just as you saw Hagar in her moment of desperation as a new mother, having suffered abuse, humiliation, and exile, you see us as well, and you promise us your redemption. You see our suffering and struggle, and you hear our cries. We thank you that your mercies are new each morning, and that we rise to nurture the lives you've entrusted us with in the midst of it. We give thanks for the wide spectrum of motherhood represented among, here, uh, among us today. New mothers and young mothers whose children are in their most tender years. Mothers of grown children who transition to empty nests and a new chapter of self-discovery. Mothers and grandmothers of advanced years whose twilight of life is marked by the frailty of body but a potency of spirit. Theirs is the cumulative reminder that though our lives are marked by transition and change, your nurture and affection for all your children remains the same. Therefore, remind us to live with a childlike faith, curious to every wondrous mystery, attentive to your every instruction, obedient to your every command, and willing to share with every one of your children. We give you thanks, O oh God, who is a loving mother and father to us all, and in whose name we pray. Amen. As we approach communion time, I have been asked to give a communion meditation this morning, but I need your help. I'm not going to do it all myself. We're going to read some scripture together, <clears throat> and Todd's going to put it up on the screen. The lighter print I will read, and the darker bold print 
uh, we'll read in unison. And the children, I need your help too. If you can read, then you're part of this. And we read in unison, there's kind of a rhythm. It's like when we say the Lord's Prayer together or when you say the Pledge of Allegiance in the public school. We're going to tell the whole story this morning of God's Word. I've chosen scriptures from different places. I'm hoping they're familiar enough that you can see when we skip from one thing to another. So join me as we, we begin. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. But the Lord God called to man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And after he had rem he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. And the Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham, for I have made you the father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings, of rams, and of the fat of fatted animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. And he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. By his wounds we are healed. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give a birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. And the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. And he took bread. He gave thanks and broke it. He gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. But they kept shouting, Crucify him, crucify him. And Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. One of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear and bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. And the angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. And when he was at table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and began to give it to them. Their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. 
and he disappeared from their sight. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Amen. Let us share the body and the blood of the one who gives us life now and life eternal. Loving Father, Lord, we seek to follow your Son in all that we do. Lord, we seek to mirror his life, his actions, and especially those particularly important, particularly holy things that he calls us to participate in, these, these sacraments. Lord, we gather around this table to remember him to remember what you've done through him, to remember his life, 
to grieve his death, to celebrate that he is risen. Lord, we pray that at this moment, Lord, that this be a sacrament of your unity, Lord, a sacrament of your presence in each of us, yes, but within this body, or the body of your Son. Lord, as we partake of these elements today in unison, Lord, focus our hearts, focus our minds on him, that as we do this, we do so in remembrance of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. On the night he was to be betrayed, Jesus gathered with his disciples to celebrate the Passover. During the meal, he took the bread, he broke it, gave thanks, passed it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Later during the meal, He took the cup, he poured it, blessed it, and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. pray over our offering. Loving Father, Lord, you have shown us that you are a generous God. Lord, you created the universe as a a stage on which to be generous. You created us simply so that you could be generous to us, so that you could show us by the many ways that you've blessed us that that you love us, Lord. We thank you so much for that. We thank you for all the ways in our lives that you've blessed us, the people around us, our families, our church families. Lord, the resources that you give as a means in this world to do your work. Lord, whatever it is that you've blessed us with, we set aside this time to give back to you, to say thank you, to show you that, Lord, we, Lord, we, hold on to the fact that we are an image of you. We seek to reflect your generosity, your love to the world around us. Lord, as we as we give this morning, whether it be of our time, of our talents, of our skills, whether we give of our money, Lord, whatever it is, as we give, Lord, may the world see you in us, see you 
in the way that we obey this command to give of ourselves. Lord, we thank you again for all the blessings you pour upon us, and especially those of your son. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Children's Church. I'm Mr. Rob, everybody. Um, we have several guests with us today, and you are welcome up through fifth grade to come with us, and parents, I will bring everyone back to in here at the end of service, so you are welcome to come join us if you'd like, and we may even at the end go outside and play on the playground if that's enticing at all. All right. All right. All right. We're going to go now. As the kids make their way down to Children's Church, those of you who saw my name in the bulletin and were anticipating a longer than normal sermon today, now's the time to break out those energy bars, stretch your legs, going to be in for, a, in for a long afternoon. Like any first time parent, I had in mind that I was supposed to be different somehow. I looked back and examined all my interactions with parents throughout my life. My parents, my grandparents, all my friends who became parents long before my wife Diana and I became parents. And there was much that I wanted to do differently, much of which had me excited about being a parent. One of the things I most looked forward to about parenthood was getting to explain things. And I'll admit that getting to explain things to my daughters it's a lot of fun. It's fun to explain how the world works and watch as she, as she understands. I promise that I would never dismiss her curiosity. I would never deny her the desire to understand. Well, then Delaney entered the dreaded why phase of her life. Put that down. Why? Because you could get hurt. Why? Because it's sharp. Why? Because it's meant to cut paper. Why? Because they don't make paper in all the sizes and shapes that we need. Why? Because that wouldn't make any business sense. Why? Because it wouldn't justify the cost of production. Why? 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 Yes, I had some pretty lofty ideas about parenting. So you can imagine my horror when I first heard those age-old words come from my, uh, my own mouth. Because I said so. That's why. Obedience is difficult for children. As both a child and a father, I know this. Obedience is also difficult for disciples. As a disciple, I know this too. Whether you're a child or a disciple or both, obedience is especially difficult when you're told something that you do not want to hear. When your expectations are dashed. When you do not get what you want. And maybe especially difficult when you're left alone, without supervision. While obedience may be most difficult in these moments, it's in these moments that obedience is also most important. Your safety, your life, maybe even the fate of the whole world might depend on your obedience. Such was the case for the Son of Man and his band of troubled hearts. 
as we've read through the Gospel of John, Jesus has gathered a close circle of disciples, witnesses to his many miracles, objects of his love. While their lives were far from easy, it's hard to imagine that Jesus' first disciples had all that much to be troubled about. For starters, what a blessing it must have been to follow a physical Jesus. A Jesus they could see and hear and touch. A Jesus they could share a meal with. A Jesus who would rebuke them. A Jesus who would stand between them and the evils of this world. How privileged his first disciples were to have had him in the flesh. To be held in his arms. To hear his sweet voice. To see his loving smile. His was the only Jesus they had ever known, of course. From the moment he called them, from the moment he said, follow me, they knew no other Jesus than this man who seemed to be a bit more than a man. The only Jesus was a present Jesus. And they had little cause to anticipate an absent Jesus, at least until that final fateful Passover feast, when he told them some things they did not want to hear that one of them would betray him. Another would deny him. And he would not be present with them for much longer. And his disciples panic. Where are you going? Tell us the way. Show us the Father. Why not show yourself to the whole world? Why? This morning, we we'll reflect on Jesus' words found in John chapter 14, offered amidst their confusion. His words were meant to comfort them, and so I pray are a comfort for us. Let us read beginning in verse 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms, If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the place, you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. If you love me, keep my commands and I will ask the Father And he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him. For he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore. But you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. 
on that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me say, I'm going away and I'm coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not say much more to you, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me, but he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let us leave. Join me in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for eyes and ears and minds to read and understand or just to approach your word. Lord, we thank you for its work in our lives. We thank you for your son, the embodiment of his word and his words here. Lord, may they be a comfort to us. May they be a guide to us as they were to his first disciples. Lord, we thank you for the ways that you work through these words and through your son and through us. Lord, we pray that we do so faithfully, that we follow you faithfully, that we obey you faithfully, that we read this word and practice this word faithfully. And we pray these things in the name of your son. Amen. <clears throat> Imagine yourself in the upper room during this, his final sermon. Night has fallen. Spirits are broken. You're afraid for your life. And somehow, what's more, you're afraid for your Lord. Not a few minutes before, you had this idea that he was some great liberator. That he would free God's people from Roman bondage. Do these words comfort you? Imagine reading this during the worst night of your life. Maybe it was your first night without the person you love most in the world. Maybe it was a night from which you couldn't foresee a tomorrow. Maybe you were alone or afraid or in agony. Would these words bring you comfort? I'll be honest, I have to look pretty hard for the comfort Jesus offers in this moment. As we've seen through the Gospels, Jesus has this way of not really answering the question that was asked, but a different question, a somehow better question. As wonderful as it must have been to sit by his side and ask him questions, I have to imagine his disciples grew a little bit frustrated with all the parables and riddles and metaphors that they often received in reply. How can we know the way? I am the way and the truth and the life. Why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. Why? Because I said so. Now to understand this passage and access its comfort, I think it's helpful to read this entire exchange, this, this entire final lesson from the teacher to his students with all, without all the chapter divisions. Beginning in John 13, as we read last week, and through John 16, Jesus is preparing his disciples 
for something new. He's preparing them for his next and his last and his most incredible miracle and whatever it is that lay beyond it. He's preparing them for that which we experience every day and the burden which our brothers and sisters around that table had yet to carry, an absent Jesus. Now, I've had some rough days, weeks, years in my life, times when I've laid my head down at night and felt distant from God. Moments where I was as sure of his absence as I had once been of his presence. And friends, that, that absence hurts. Their hearts were troubled that night. Their hearts would be even more troubled as Jesus is led away in shackles and as they scatter into the darkness. They would be even more troubled as his lifeless corpse is dropped from its cross. And the message that they are given in comfort, perhaps a, a stinging balm and an open and fresh wound, is what few followers, children or disciples, want to hear in moments of profound disappointment. Words like, I am the way and the truth and the life. Trust me. Believe me. Keep my commands. Obey me. Obedience here is a strong word. It's a hard calling. And perhaps a strange calling to hear in this moment. As faithful practicing Jews... His disciples were obedient to the law, just like their Lord. After all, they had gathered that very night to remember the Passover. But I would guess that their own personal obedience wasn't first in mind as Jesus spoke to them. Over the course of his ministry, he who had come to fulfill the law was more often accused of breaking it. In the eyes of his enemies, Jesus' ministry wasn't one of obedience, but of disobedience. So we, we must be careful with obedience, just as they had to be. Most systems of human belief are founded on strict obedience. Islam, Judaism, even corners of Christianity put strict obedience to the letter of Scripture first. Those who sought to kill Jesus and suppress his ministry were doing so out of obedience because they put obedience first. The Pharisees were the most religious and obedient people of their time. They were preeminent scholars of God's word, of God's law. In many ways, they were wise and pious and judicious and endeavored to love God by their obedience to his commandments. Jesus knew this. The disciples knew this too. And Jesus also knew, as the disciples were learning, that obedience to the law wasn't enough. If simple obedience were enough to reconcile with the Father, of what use would his son be? He need not take on flesh and die a most miserable death if our way to salvation is one that we could discern for ourselves. No, obedience wasn't enough. And yet, yet still Jesus commanded obedience at this most crucial juncture of his way on earth. He didn't console them. He didn't say his way would be easy. In fact, they were about to learn just how hard his way would be. Instead, he offered a guarantee that while his way may not be easy, it is the only way. And by obedience to it, its destination is assured. So what then, you're probably wondering, is the difference? Where do the pharisaical path of obedience and the messianic path of obedience diverge. If we listen, Jesus tells us. If you love me, keep my commands. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. All these things are happening so the world may know that I love the Father and do exactly as he commanded me. We may not immediately recognize all the connections between love and obedience. We don't stay late at work or pay our taxes out of love. At least I don't. As much as I love my wife and daughter, I don't often wash the dishes out of love. 
contrary to the loveless obedience so common in our world, which was just as common in first century Judea, Jesus was establishing a new covenant of obedience. We don't obey first as the Pharisees did. We love first. And we don't just love the people around us, our family, our church family, our community. We love God first as both the origin and the destination of this love, with God the Son as the way between them. Obedience was not to be the root of love, but the fruit of it, just as it was with Jesus. The surpassing comfort to be found here, comfort for those hearing his words that night and who read them this morning, is that through the means of this unusual loving obedience, Jesus was addressing his forthcoming absence. He was showing the way for all people of all time to still find him, to still see him, hear him, and hold him, no matter when or where they were confronting their own troubled hearts. Because as Jesus ordained, those who love him and those who therefore gather in obedience to him, they are the body of Christ, the church. His disciples had many expectations subverted that night and, and in the nights to come. But they had to expect that whatever church their Lord was forming would still be embodied by him, would still be led by him. Now they were right, of course, but that comfort was far from their hearts as they began to consider that this church, that this new body, might live and grow from their own loving obedience. As we read through Jesus' words in John's Gospel, and especially those in this and the surrounding chapters, it's easy to see how profoundly communal his commands are. Reconcile with your brother. Forgive your brother. Serve each other. Love one another. In Todd's sermon last week on John chapter 13, we considered Christ as an example. Todd reminded us that love isn't simply a noun, but most importantly a verb. We often think of love as something we receive. And while that's important, we must remember love as something we do. In John chapter 14, Jesus exhorts his disciples, do not just as you would have others do unto you, but as I do. Just a few verses before what we read earlier, Jesus calls for obedience to a new command. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. This kind of love that bears fruit of obedience has more than power. It has permanence. Throughout his ministry, Jesus makes famous several I am statements. As we examine one of these statements today, I am the way and the truth and the life. It's important to realize that when Jesus says, I am, this isn't just a description or an identification. It's a promise. It's an eternal promise. He isn't saying that he was those things or that he soon will be those things. He's saying that he is those things, no matter when we might encounter his holy words. Their truth and their power do not depend on when or where we hear them. Here in John 14, Jesus is saying that not only will he continue to be present, and though far different from what they've experienced, different from what they've expected, he will always be present with his disciples, with us. It seems almost silly to say, yet it's anything but silly, that Jesus will always be present in the body of Christ. This is a covenant and a comfort that transcends centuries, that brings his followers into fellowship not simply with him, but with all of his body, those whose obedience we enjoy yesterday, today, and tomorrow. His presence, though, is not enabled in our obedience, but rather fulfilled in our obedience. 
If we love Jesus, this love should and does compel us not simply to obey, but to demonstrate our love in a way that Jesus demonstrated his love. In a way that makes it clear to those who see us and hear us, those we hold, that we do so not simply in obedience to some divine checklist, but because we have divine love. We love God and therefore love each other. And just as those who saw Jesus had seen the Father, may those who see us see the Son and be drawn into fellowship not only to be served, but to serve. Not only to be loved, but to love, to obey. This is how Jesus comforted his disciples' troubled hearts. He was going away, and yet he would be coming back. And in the meantime, he would be with them. He would be in them. And his presence would be known to the whole world by how they loved and the obedience that love produced. Obedience is the fruit of the Father's love. And our obedience in the model of his Son is the only way to ever taste of his sweetness. He has ascended to the Father. He is not here except in us, his disciples. Our obedience is how others might know of the joy only those few disciples knew and what we now know, that the good news of their soon-to-be absent yet always present Lord will show the way, reveal the truth, and raise the obedient to new life. But that's not all. Just as Jesus knew that obedience to the law would never be enough, he knew that his disciples, then and now, would fail in obedience to his new commands. They would lose the way, forget the truth, and reject the life. He had just predicted a betrayal and a denial. As confidently as Jesus states, I am, Peter will soon, with just as much confidence upon the question of if he is a disciple, say, I am not. And so amidst the, the difficult news he had for them, including a departure, he also announced an arrival, the gift of the Holy Spirit. In the words of Puritan Richard Sibbs, a weak hand may receive a rich jewel. Only a few grapes need show that the plant is a vine and not a thorn. Those who believe in him, those who love him, those who model their lives after his will receive the Spirit an advocate, a helper, a counselor, a supernatural means given to natural men to empower their work in Jesus' name. The Spirit is both the mechanism of conversion in response to obedience and also the means by which our obedience is empowered and sustained. By the Spirit, we may do miracles equal in power and glory to those of our Lord. By the Spirit, we may deliver God's word and transform the world by the Spirit, we may be baptized and raised to new life. Friends, this is the comfort of John chapter 14. This is the comfort of Jesus Christ. The comfort to those in that dark room that night. The comfort to those of us in a dark world today. But Jesus Christ is always present. He is always among his body. He is always offering comfort to the troubled heart. That the words we say and the works we do become, by his presence in our obedience, not our own, but those of God. The word of God. The work of God. Yes, we, we may admit that there was a special thrill to be with the bodily Jesus. But what a grace we have that he abides in us and we in him. That we are bound together in spirit as the body of Christ. Demonstrating his loving nature as our own. Demonstrating his presence on earth as our own. And we pray that, that others may gather to eat of the fruit of our obedience. To taste in our love his sweetness. And to receive the Holy Spirit that they may be empowered to tell others of the comfort we've told them. And what our Lord has told us. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. 
For Jesus Christ is among us and is here to stay. And the best of all comforts is to follow his way, believe in his truth, and live his life. Why? Because he said so. Let us pray. Loving Father, Lord, we are thankful again for your word. We are thankful for your commands. Lord, those expressed in your word, but also those exemplified in your son. Lord, his life was a commandment. Lord, when he said to us, follow me, that wasn't a single command, but Lord, a large gathering of, of different commands of how he loved, how he showed himself to others, how he taught. Lord, every action, every choice, everything he did, every word he said, Lord, we pray that we can follow him in those things. We pray that as we gather as the body of Christ, that as we are together in your name, Lord, that we be blessed by that. Lord, that we be blessed by studies in your word, prayers offered together, Lord, communion taken together, and Lord, that we can learn from others in teaching this word, in showing in their lives, Lord, your son. We pray that we do that ourselves. Lord, we pray that we take on his way and his truth and his life. Lord, we pray that we model that, not just so that we might follow his way to you and to what you've prepared for us, but that others may do so too. Lord, that by our example and by our obedience, only that modeled in your son, that others might come to you and be saved. God, we thank you for that. We thank you for the grace that we find in his life and the abundant grace we find in his death and resurrection. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. At the end of our service each week, we set aside this time as an invitation. It's an invitation to decide, to follow, to obey. When Jesus gave commands, he often gave those commands as invitations. There's always a choice, friends. You can follow his way to his father's house, or you can go your own way and see where that leads you. Now, some of you, many of you, most of you perhaps, have made that choice. You've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior and have committed to follow him and obey him. But that commitment is never perfect. It's never easy. It's never completed. We are invited again to make that decision to follow our Lord for as many times as we have choices in our lives. So today, be invited to recommit yourself in obedience to our Lord. As Scottish minister George MacDonald once preached, get up and do something the master tells you to do. So make yourself his disciple at once. Instead of asking yourself whether you believe or not, ask yourself whether you have this day done one thing because he said do it. Or once abstained because he said do not do it. It is simply absurd to say you believe or even want to believe if you do not anything he tells you. Now some of you make that commitment regularly but are looking for a church community in which to fulfill that commitment. Here at FCC, we would love for you to join us, for we too love God and seek to obey him. But we pray just as hard for revival down the street. Chances are pretty good that you've got a faithful, loving church within a 10-minute drive of your house. If not here, go there, talk to somebody, be with those people, and let them see Jesus by how you obey him. Faith alone saves, but the faith that saves can never be alone. Now, some of you have not yet accepted the invitation to follow Jesus. And I understand that. It's an overwhelming commitment. It's the most important decision you'll ever make in your life. You should think about it. You should read about it, pray about it, talk about it with somebody. You should take your time. And while you shouldn't rush, be prompt. Start today. Start right now. And we commit to being beside you and helping you to understand the abundant grace found in obedience to Christ our Lord. Now, if any of this is too difficult to do publicly, don't leave here today without talking to somebody. Faith in Jesus, it must be personal,
but it can never be private. Someone tried to hug you, shake your hand earlier today. Someone said hello to you. Find that person and tell them what's on your heart, especially if yours is a troubled heart. For there is no comfort for the troubled heart like the embracing body of Christ. Now as Joe and Katie sing, stand with us in song and praise. And if there's a decision weighing on your heart, let us bear it with you. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided announcements before we close in prayer and I'll try to do this in chronological order beginning today as you leave the sanctuary in the very last pew there are some gifts for all the ladies with us here today so don't forget to pick one up on your way out somebody will be back there facilitating that I'm sure I'm not sure who but you'll see they'll be the one with all the gifts um, so after that if you haven't already find women who are important to you in your life and tell them that they are thank them for what they've done. Thank them for how they've shown God's love to you in your life and helped to nurture you and care for you and love you. So if you had, well, have Mother's Day plans, make them quickly. Text somebody. If they're not here, get with, get with those people who are important to you and let them know that they are. I think here in, on Wednesday, um, we are not having our normal Wednesday activities. Uh, again, children and youth are on a break on Wednesday nights. The adults are taking a break as well for a couple of weeks. We will be back together again here in two weeks on the 24th. We will be gathering with our friends at Northridge Community Church for another night of worship and prayer. Um, this is their Koinonia service. They had one a month or two ago um, that, we, that we had a pleasure of taking part in them with. And so if you're interested in that, we're going to be putting that out on Facebook and elsewhere. The broadcaster for this week is already printed, so I can't change that or at least not without you know, marking out 40 copies of the broadcaster, so we won't do that. But um, we'll be announcing that and how you can um, get involved with that. Um, they're looking for those who wish to pray or read something as a part of that service. So if that's something that would interest you, come talk to me, um, and I'll get you in touch with the folks at Northridge, and we can make that happen. Um, and this was yesterday, so it's not really applicable anymore. Um, I think that's all the announcements. Any other announcements that I've forgotten? Judy? Sure, yeah. Yeah, for those who didn't hear that, Karen Share, which is our local benevolence ministry, is in a period of renewal, rehabilitation, where we're freshening it up a lot. There's a lot of property related tasks to be done, and especially tasks that are coming due this week. So if you have time this week to contribute to that, to help move some heavy things, things like that, um, talk to Judy or Bill, talk to me. 
We're happy to get you connected and tell you when and where to be. Any other announcements before we close? Okay, let's close in prayer. Loving Father, Lord, we thank you again for the chance to gather this morning. Lord, we thank you for that work of your son, not, not simply the, the redemption that we have through belief in him, but Lord, that he instituted this church. Lord, that he gave to us his body, that we might find comfort in each other. Lord, we are gathered here in faith and obedience and love to him. Lord, we pray that that, that faithfulness, that that love, that that obedience be evident in all the ways that we interact with each other and all the ways that we interact with those who aren't yet a part of the body. And we pray that that obedience is evident to them. Lord, it doesn't take much. It doesn't take perfection, Lord, as some teach. It just takes faith. It takes love. And Lord, we pray that those produce at least a few grapes on this vine from which others can taste. We thank you for that. And we pray these things in the name of your son. Amen. Go in peace.